Good morning. Good morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to John McMillan Presbyterian Church. I am Jeff Tyndall, the senior pastor here at the church, and I'll be your liturgist today. The Reverend Samantha Coggins will be preaching our sermon today, and our choir director is Carolyn Bro, and our organist is Elizabeth Jeffries, but as you may have noticed, she is not with us this morning. She is not feeling well, and so she will be returning to us very soon, we hope. Whether you are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or you are worshiping with us at home on Facebook Live or perhaps you're worshiping with us later today on YouTube, uh, we are glad you are here. If you're a longtime member, we, want, we are ecstatic that you continue to worship with us. And if you're a visitor here today, uh, we ask that you at some point in time let us know that you are here uh, so that we can give you the appropriate visitor welcome. So whether you have arrived today with a heart that is heavy and anxious, or whether you have a heart that is light and joyful, we come here to worship God and enter into God's presence. Our mission here at John McMillan is to know, serve, and glorify God, and we invite you to ponder what gifts you might have to share with this church. If it is your very first time here, please sign the friendship pad so that we can see who you are. At the beginning of each row, there is a connection, there is a a friendship pad that you can sign in on, and there's also connection QR codes all over the place. So please feel free to do whatever you do with a QR code, because I don't know what that is, but, <laughs> but some of you do, and so please take care of that. Um, so any case, uh, I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I'm glad you're here, because after the worship service today, we're having our chili dog luncheon. And so we're asking everybody to stay and have the John McMillan Presbyterian Church special world-famous chili dogs uh, prepared by our fellowship committee. I also want to tell you that uh, the Christmas affair will be this coming Saturday. And it's, uh, it is a big deal here at the church. If you have never seen this before or participated in it before, it is remarkable. You come in, uh, you leave today, and the church looks like the church. You come here on Saturday, and it looks like something you've perhaps never seen before. And then Sunday when you come back, it's all back in place, and it takes a lot of work to do that. So please, if you can, uh, share your time and your talents with us for the Christmas affair this week. Uh, and we also have the contemplative service this evening at 7 o'clock for those who are looking for a more quiet, meditative worship service. And the men's breakfast will be tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. So having said all that, let us worship the living God. you stand if you can and join in the call to worship. The heavens declare the righteousness of God. The earth, the earth declares God's beauty. From the rising of the sun to its setting, God's word shines forth in glory.
You may be seated. Even in our brokenness and faithlessness, God's love is still with us and waits in mercy to forgive us of everything we have done that is contrary to God's will. Trusting in the promises given at our baptism, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Will you please join me in the prayer of confession? Holy God, you promise us a life full of blessing, but we do not always believe. You incite us to hope, but we fall back into fear. You urge us to give freely, but we cling to what we have. You call us to watch at all times for you, but we grow lazy and self-absorbed. Forgive us, increase our hope, enlarge our hearts, and keep us alert to the wonder of your work in the world every day. For Jesus' sake, we pray. God is merciful and kind. Though our sins are like scarlet, they become like snow. Be at peace, for your sins are washed clean by the goodness and love of God. Thanks be to God. may be seated. On behalf of the session of John Millen Presbyterian Church, I now invite to come forward for recognition those who have been received into membership of this congregation. Evan and Emily Dudley, Jonah and Alyssa Hatfield, John and Kathleen Mazzola. As you can see, like everybody, they're really excited that they're coming up to stand in front of you all. So you can turn and face the congregation. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> you have come to us as members of the one holy... Catholic Church into which you were baptized and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God, and we rejoice in the gifts you bring us. As you join with us in the worship and service of this congregation, it is fitting that together we reaffirm the covenant into which we were baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in baptism. Hear the words of Scripture. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all are one in Jesus Christ. Sisters and brothers, our baptism is a sign and seal of our cleansing from sin and of our being grafted into Christ. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken and God's kingdom entered into the world. Through our baptism, we are made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. And so let us celebrate that freedom and redemption through the renewal of the promises that were made at our baptism. So I have these questions for you. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? 
Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? These pages are not cooperating. Thank you. Will you be faithful members of this congregation? Share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ, will you? Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number brothers and sisters in faith. Together, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom we give honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Before you leave, we have gifts for you. Thank you. Why don't you bring that one? Unfortunately, what's not in here is the double secret recipe for the chili that goes on the chili dogs when we get together for our chili dog Sundays. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest members of John McMillan Presbyterian Church. Let us offer up our hearts in prayer. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, because we are not strong enough to pray as we should, you provide Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit to intercede for us in power. In this confidence, we ask that you accept our prayers. Lord, we pray for the church. Faithful God, you formed your church from the despised of the earth and showed them mercy, that they may proclaim your salvation to all. We ask that you strengthen those whom you choose today, that they may be faithful and endure all trials, by which you conform your church to the cross of Christ. Let us pray for creation. Creator of all, you entrusted the earth to the human race. Yet we disrupt its peace with violence and corrupt its purity with our greed. Prevent your people from ravaging creation. The coming generations may inherit lands brimming with life and beauty. And for the world, sovereign God, you hold both history and nations and the humble life of villages in your care. Preserve the people of every nation from tyrants. Heal them of disease. Lead them to peace and protect them in time of upheaval and disaster that all may enter the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Lord, let us pray this morning for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia. Let us pray for the, pray for the people of South Korea and North Korea. Let us pray for the people of Somalia, and let us pray for all people who live in conflict in their countries. For those who govern us, God Most High, in Jesus of Nazareth, you show us the authority that pleases you. For he rules not by power or might, but serves in obedience to your will. We pray for all in authority over us, for our president, for the members of Congress, for our governor for those in our state legislature, and we ask that you deliver them from vain ambitions, that they may govern in wisdom and justice. We pray for our community. Merciful God, since Jesus longed to protect Jerusalem as the hen gathers her young under her wings, we ask you to guard and strengthen all who live and work here. Deliver your people from jealousy and contempt that they may show mercy to all their neighbors. 
Lord, this is particularly true in this time of election when people have been polarized and cannot even speak to each other without fear that they will be somehow oppressed verbally or physically abused. Lord, show us the way to live peacefully, to govern well, and to elect the leaders that you would have us elect. Lord, let us also pray for those who suffer any sorrow or trial. Lord, compassionate God, your Son gives rest to those weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. Lift up the depressed to befriend those who grieve. Comfort the anxious. Stand with all victims of abuse and violence. Uphold those who live with addiction. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit that we may bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, this morning we lift up Linda Pellin, who is suffering from COVID. For Dan Davies, who is recovering from surgery. For Ryan Bogdan, who broke his leg this week. For the family of Jean James, who passed on to the church triumphant this week. For Emily Shabilla and Emily's mother, Sherry DeFabio, who has been hospitalized this past week. For the family and friends of Pastor Pablo Feliciano Cruz, who died on October 13th. Lord, we ask that you keep these people in your comfort and care during these difficult times. Merciful God, since Jesus longed to protect Jerusalem, again, as a hen gathers its children, we also pray this week for those who are uh, members of our congregation, Walter and Marjorie Till, Karen Timko, Karen and Steve Timpona, Chris, Heidi, Jonathan, Catherine, Anna, and Elizabeth Todd, and Karen Todd. Lastly, God, your love is stronger than death and your passion more fierce than the grave. We rejoice in the lives of those whom you have drawn into your eternal embrace. Keep us in joyful communion with them until we join the saints of every people and nation gathered before your throne in ceaseless praise. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. treasures in heaven, O oh people, lay up your treasures in glory, where nothing in this world can take them away. Oh, listen, people, hear the Master say, come and lay up your treasures in heaven, O oh people, lay up your treasures in glory, your treasures in this world will fade away, but the things of the Lord will last forever. Oh, 
Amen. And thank you, choir, for the anthem a cappella this morning in the absence of Elizabeth Jeffries, our organist. And thank you, Carolyn, for that gift. And we hope Elizabeth is doing well today. It's good to be with you today. It is good to see new people and familiar people here. I have been absent from the sanctuary for what feels like forever. I was worshiping with the youth at the, the church in Duquesne three weeks ago, and then I got COVID two weeks ago, and last week I had the honor of preaching at a dear friend's ordination service at her ordination in North Carolina. So it is good to be back with you here at JMPC. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, <laughs> verses 32 through 34. Listen now for what God is saying to God's people. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you dare? Haunted Carnegie walking tours spook and delight attendees. That was the front page headline recently in the Almanac, one of the South Hills community newspapers that I get where I live in Mount Lebanon. I think Halloween at its best is a season of spook and delight. Cosette, my daughter, realizes this, and she's not even two years old. I was strolling around our block with her the other day, and a friendly neighbor spotted me and the baby. He showed Cozy how the ghost hanging from his porch could wiggle and wail. And Cosette's eyes told me she was both fascinated by this and very unsure about what was going on. She wanted to look away, I could tell. She was delighted and spooked, even as a toddler. Perhaps Jesus is here with us in Luke today to spook and delight the disciples, and maybe even us, about wealth, money, generosity. Like a welcoming house in the neighborhood on Halloween night, make us flinch and to satisfy us, to push us to prepare ourselves for what might lie around the corner, what might pop out or catch us next, safe from pranksters who might be roaming. I contend that this part about selling your possessions and giving alms is spooky. It creeps up on us, like the fake skeletons we see this time of year, half buried in somebody's front yard. This idea of a direct relationship between the actual things and objects that we have, like money or the food and clothing we buy with it, that those ought to be sacrificed to enflesh somebody else, to care for their very skin and bones, that we could robe them in the dignity that God plans for us with our stuff. The idea of giving alms in the Bible is literally that you sell what you have and you use the proceeds to help someone else for free. This idea that we could be like bright jack-o'-lanterns, pumpkins that were scooped out for making fresh pies or cookies, letting the holes carved in them act as windows of light. It's scary thinking of scooping yourself out like that 
getting holes put in you. It requires you to recognize where you have something to give and then take it out of yourself and then trust in God's creativity and ultimately to sacrifice something, to wind up with less than you started with. The emphasis on selling possessions and using the proceeds to give alms is unique to the Gospel of Luke, which is a gospel that's very focused on wealth and giving. One pastor commenting on the passage put it this way, Jesus calls for a shift away from a world in which some people survive only because privileged people chose to act morally from time to time. I hear that, and it resonates with me. But also, consistent sacrifice is hard, is it not? Maybe because there's many opportunities for luck to take us far in this land we live in. I read an article last week and said, there is something Americans spend more money on each year than coffee, cigarettes, or smartphones. It is lottery tickets. Frankly, isn't there real delight in this sort of gambling? The blessing of the occasional scratch off? Like a child dressed up going to every house, betting their awesome costume will earn them the biggest candy bar. Alexander Hamilton stated it bluntly when lotteries first started in the U.S. that everyone would prefer to have a small chance of winning a lot over a big chance of winning little. And yet, Jesus gives the disciples an image of care here that has little to do with winning big. He calls them little flock. He tells them not to be afraid, implying that some of them are probably already afraid. Jesus gives it to them straight. You're going to have to give so that somebody else can have what they need. That is exactly how you will have unfailing treasure in heaven, as the choir sang about. So grab the biggest candy bars, Jesus says, but find a way not to get sick off of them. Certainly we have economies of care here at this church that take our focus away from winning big, that zero in on how to truly shift our possessions in the way Jesus is asking. I've seen it in my six months here on staff. I've witnessed it a lot in the Duquesne Shared Blessings store ministry, which we're collecting blankets for out in the narthex right now. At a recent session meeting, we all agreed that our relationship through the Duquesne Shared Blessings store is nimble and effective it's not based on luck. It's a system where everybody wins. It is a pattern of giving that recognizes, while there are many people in this congregation who, for example, have blankets to spare, there are many people in Duquesne who don't and who actually might be facing a winter where they or their children are cold at night. While I agree with the, se the session that this is a scenario in which everybody wins, I'd also add this. That is a kingdom-building scenario because we are blessedly not keeping track of who's winning there. I bet nobody in this congregation is sitting here wondering right now, did we win by giving blankets to the Duquesne Church? Well, great, it seems like as good a time as any to believe in the land plenty, as they sing on the radio. Maybe. Recently in women's book study <coughs> here at John McMillan Prez, we read about a woman who encouraged simple living in her household. She gave an honest account of how it went. 
She reported that when her kids started making homemade gifts, instead of buying gifts to take to their friends' birthday parties, some of their friends stopped inviting them to the parties. Similarly, I was recently in the house of a friend who had decided to commit to recycling and upcycling and to buying only secondhand items, nothing new, as far as she could realistically do it. In her kitchen, I was frantic. I could not find a paper towel to save my life. It was chaos. She had no dishwasher, and I did not know how to function there. Or to put it differently, what if you decided this year, no second trip to Disney this summer. You guys were taking that budget and you can treat some of your friends in middle school or at your high school to go on a walk here in Pittsburgh, to go hiking, to have lunch together, to go buy food to make a meal together. How would that go over with our children? Friends, there is a lot at stake for our personal lives here. I think Jesus is asking us to flinch. The idea of our children being deprived of time with their friends or of being faced with your own reliance on an object like I was with the paper towels or the idea that your children could just be so disappointed and be deprived of fun. That's really frightening. Here is one piece of the good news, though. Jesus is not running a cheap scare house. Jesus' words here are not meant to terrify us about how we will accumulate treasure in heaven by giving our money to the church. Jesus is not sitting at a table in bad makeup, holding out his hand to collect our $25, make us scream in fear, and send us away in shame that we couldn't handle the haunted house. Today on Consecration Sunday, I invite you to look at your stewardship, your patterns of giving money to this church, like the best Halloween, with a sense of spook, and delight. Knowing it is God's pleasure to give us the kingdom, which Jesus literally tells us here today in Luke. Seek opportunities to literally give your money to this church so that we can build the kingdom. So that our youth can paint tables at First Presbyterian Church in Duquesne, making a place to sit for people who come to that garden because they need fresh vegetables and fruits. So that we can travel as a congregation to places like Malawi, where we can open ourselves up to being transformed by other people's spiritual riches that their simple living fosters, and to participate in eradicating poverty. And so that we can encourage each other here, day in and day out, to do things like what one member of this congregation reported to me that she plans to do this year. I'm buying all my Christmas gifts local, handmade this year. I'm tired of these companies getting my money. Shifting our personal spending patterns in a way that reallocates our treasure to those who actually need it. Last week, I happened to be in the office when another church member came by the office to drop off his giving envelope. I hadn't met this person yet, being new here myself, and I learned that he does this every month. He said, I'm committed to my faith. I need to come to church more often, he said a, a bit sheepishly, laughing. And I got to know him a little bit, standing there for 10 minutes in the office. He told me about his kids, and he shared some stories about a beloved pet. It struck me that at that moment, he was attending church, 
and he had nothing to be ashamed about. His commitment to dropping off his treasure, his monetary gift, to the church each month was inviting me into his life. And it was prompting him to think further about how to express his faith. Where his treasure was, his heart was also. Our unfailing treasure, the title of this sermon, has been prepared for us by Jesus. Will we be like children, fascinated and really unsure of Jesus jumping out and saying boo to us? As you consider your giving patterns to this church at the end of this stewardship season and for the rest of the year, do not be afraid. Be delighted. And spend your treasure here in a way that might make you flinch a little. Do you dare? May it be so. Amen. The last three weeks here at John McMillan Church, we have been in our stewardship mode. A few weeks ago, I talked about how we spend our time and the time we can spend here at the church. Last week, I talked about our talents, and our talents are necessary to make the church beautiful and give it depth. This week, Reverend Samantha was responsible for sending out the big ask. But I wanted to share a couple of other thoughts as well. The financial support we need here to flourish as disciples as Jesus on this as disciples of Jesus on this hill is not insubstantial. And as Reverend Coggan said, it's not something to be afraid of. It's something that should challenge us all and give us delight when we can fulfill it. What financial support do we need? Four hundred forty thousand dollars. That's what we need to carry out the mission and ministry of this church. But one of the things you are allowed to do when we ask you for such a large sum of money is say, Pastor Jeff, Samantha, Carolyn, Elizabeth, Emily, how do we spend that money? How are you going to spend it? Well, this week in the mail, you received or will receive an envelope. It looks like this. Inside that, this is mine. I got it too, <laughs> just so you know. Although I knew what was in it when it got here. So th you open the envelope, and this is what you find. You find a letter from the resources pillar of the church. Jeff Wollstonecroft, Chris Altmeyer, and Chris Todd. That basically explains to you our stewardship campaign, how much money we need, and any changes that we have experienced financially over the last couple of years. So when you get this, open it and read it. The other thing you're going to get is this. It is a narrative budget. It is one thing to see an actual budget where you are shown exactly how much money is given to the staff, how much money is given to building and grounds, how much money is given to mission, how much money is given to fellowship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those numbers basically can be very confusing. But inside the narrative budget, what we have done is we have assigned percentages of the money that comes into the church to what I call the five true pillars of our mission and ministry here. Worship, pastoral care, education, and on the back, mission and fellowship. So every dollar that you give to the church is divided up among these five pillars 
as you see on the screen in front of you or as you can look in the narrative budget. That is how we are spending your money. You should know it. You are entitled to know it. And now you do. This is what your money will do in this community and the communities surrounding us in 2023. The last thing you get is what we call the est family estimate of giving card. And see, in this church, we recognize that there are lots of families who have lots of members of the church in them, but that the family gives as a unit. We call them giving units. And so we send these out to every giving unit in the congregation and ask for you to give us an estimate of what you're going to donate to the church for these five pillars in 2023. Now, here's an interesting fact. Not everybody fills these out because some people don't like to do this. And there's lots of reasons, valid reasons, appropriate reasons for not doing this. Here's a couple of examples. If you're just graduating from college, you probably have a lot of student loan debt. And so you're constantly looking for the next job that'll give you a few more shekels so that you can pay off that debt quicker than you uh, had anticipated. Or maybe you're a young family and you just bought a house. And you're really not sure exactly how much money you can dedicate to the church. And so you might not want to fill one of these things out. And I get that. But what we are asking you to do is that when you do find that extra money, when you do find that big candy bar that you don't want your family to eat, send it here. Because when you send it here, it pays for all of these things. But we really do like to have some solid idea of what that's going to look like. And so if you can send in the estimate of giving card, please do it. Now, we have done something different this year than we have done in the past. Typically, what we do is, is we send out these estimate of giving cards, and we have our stewardship campaign, and then we have all the money come in, and we have our chili dog, well, I guess it's a brunch now. Uh, we have that come in, and then we, then we look at, then the session gets together and looks at the budget uh, based on the number of pledges that come in, and we decided that that's really not the way we should work. We should have faith in God. We should have faith in you. We should have faith in ourselves that we are going to be able to fund this amount of money not based on the pledges that come in but based on, based on our belief that this congregation has been doing it since 1965 and we believe we'll continue to do it until at least 2065. So, what we have done, what we are doing today is we are having a chili dog celebration and uh, this worship service to thank all of you for what you have given in 2022 because it appears that even though the pledges were nowhere near enough to pay what we have to pay for these five pillars in 2022, we are going to cover that cost because of your generosity and we can't thank you enough but we do thank you with chili dogs. And we're also having the festivities today to ask you to just keep it up. Keep it up so that we can continue to be disciples of Jesus Christ on this hill. We can continue to be salt and light. We can continue to be the people that God wants us to be. Doing worship, doing Christian education, doing fellowship, doing mission, doing all the things this church needs to do. And so I am asking you to pray about it, think about how you're going to do it, and let's, as a community, cover these costs. Thank you.
invite you now to remain standing in body or spirit for our affirmation of faith. <coughs> Excuse me. Which today is the Apostles' Creed. I invite you now into a posture of prayer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything. And what we seek is simply to ask that you give back a little bit of all that God has given you to God's glory and to Jesus' mission. Lord, you look down from heaven, see all mankind 
all humankind and long to call us home. Lord, we ask that you accept these gifts from all that you have given us on behalf of your people here and your people throughout our church community. Help us to use them as an increase in our faith, nurturing our hope, and giving us the righteousness that we seek to have in your sight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me, before you do that, let me, let me say that uh, Carolyn and the choir have done yo person's labor today when we found out that Elizabeth wasn't going to be joining us, and we should be appreciative of the talent that they have put together today. <laughs> and just to show you that it ain't easy up here. And now let us sing our closing hymn. Friends, go now in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to what is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. And may the blessing of God be with you, those you love, and those you're praying for, today and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.